Sorry. Thanks, guys. Um, yes, I'm Ron Reed. I'm the Australasia. We just had a, a name change from Harmony Southeast Asia to Australasia. Um, so tonight we'll be talking about the Eva Copper Project. Uh, so Harmony sort of has, has recently, in the last year or you know, a bit, come on, come into this. Um, so Harmony itself is a major South African company. We have most of our, our gold production comes out of South Africa. Most of our resources and reserves are actually in PNG um, and now in Australia as well. Um, you said it worked. Just press down on this one. Press down on that one. All righty. Um, standard explanation and get out of jail card. You can bring all that, read all that really, really quickly. Um, where, why am I going backwards? You said it worked. Good God. All right. What's happening at Eva? Uh, so Eva, Eva Copper is uh, north of, of Cloncurry, seven kilometers north of Cloncurry. It's northeast, not northeast of Mount Isa. So it, it sits at the northern end of a long string of mineralizations that sits all the way through in this part of the world, part of the um, Mary Kathleen Bowl Belt. We have had a, we've got a major, the major tenement leases we have so sit up here. We've got a exploration office in Cloncurry itself. And we've also got a hub in Cloncurry that uh, the local community can drop in on and have a chat. Um, we, it sits on several leases, although the, the two main leases, mining, uh, if, um, farming leases, yeah, leasehold, what we've got, pastoral leases, Roseby, Mount Roseby and Kalula, and we've got good relations with both those, those owners. Um, so Eva's had a long history of various companies. It was originally land, land, uh, land owned by CRA Exploration. Uh, it's they these guys and uh, Osminda the first hole Osminda drilled the first hole in the late sixties and hit a couple of bits and pieces. CRA picked up the land, did most of the drilling. Most of CRA's work was concentrated on the native copper deposits. Um, then the property was acquired by Pasminko. Pasminko went and drilled out some of the copper gold iron oxide stuff. Um, they held it for a little while and then they retained Dougal River, excised Dougal River from the package and sold the rest to Universal Resources in 2001. 2001 to 2004, Universal Resources actually had a JV with a company called Bolnese Logistics. Bolnese Logistics did some work on the native copper deposits and Universal concentrated on the copper gold um, 2004, 2005, we, when I say we, I worked for Universal at this time. So we purchased Bolnese Logistics and entered into a JV option with Extrata, who are looking for deep, deep copper. So they uh, they started doing some deep copper drill, copper holes, deep holes under um, Little Eva, Blackard, some of the other deposits. Uh, and they whacked a few holes in through the Landsborough Graben, which is the northeast. I'll show that in a minute and hit the Cabbage Tree Creek and copper copper mineralization at that, at the bottom of the graben. Uh, it moved on. So a couple of feasibilities happened. Universal merged with Vulcan, become Altona. Dougal River become part of MMG. MMG started the construction of the Dougal, Dougal River uh, mine in 2016 through to 2017. So they're now product, producing mine. Uh, it swapped, it went, uh, Altona become part of Copper Mountain. And in 2022, we bought the project from Copper Mountain. So this is a basic, the mining lease hold. So this is the, the mining leases. There's, there's five leases that comprise this part of the world. These are exploration licenses that we own. This is the Dougal River output, uh, Dougal River lease. Um, the, the various deposits, you've got Lady Clare as an iron oxide or co it's a copper gold deposit pro project. You had a series of native copper projects that sort of extend all the way up through here. You've got Bedford, which is another copper gold project. Little Eva, another copper gold project. And Turkey Creek is an interesting uh, deposit. It's actually a copper only deposit. Um, and I'll get into that in a minute. So at this point in time, 
we've got granted mining leases. We've got uh, the environmental authority in place. In place, uh, we're looking at putting some amendments in for that to to allow us to build a, a bigger operation. Um, there, we're able to simply compact layout with the mine, the tailings dam, and everything sort of poke sort of around here. Uh, accommodation village that's sitting over on the edge. Uh, so initial mining. So if we'll we'll work. We're we're looking to work from a uh, little Eva. Turkey Creek, Blackard, sort of mining this area, and then essentially stepping south as we go to supply, supply ore. Um, that's just a quick overview of the first, the main plan, uh, the, the the three main deposits that will feed into the initial initial five years or so: uh, Little Eva, Turkey Creek, Blackard, and that's the the tailings dam. I did put. We have actually um, placed tailings dam over the size of Brisbane. It sort of covers pretty much Brisbane centre, um, South Brisbane, out to the, uh, I think, Suncorp Stadium sits here and the Gabba sits about there. So it's a big, it's a big hall deposit, a uh, big uh, tailings dam. Oy, wrong way. Uh, so what work, uh, we're sort of going ahead. We're doing quite a bit of early works on the project. Um, so we've upgraded the access mine access road has been put in for the that'll be the uh, the main access to the mine. So that's all done. Uh, we're we're actually fencing out, putting in big buffer fences around the operate the, the various pits and operations to keep cattle out. Uh, the pioneer camp construction for the uh, the village that we're starting to build. Um, water construction, water upside updating tracks, and also starting the clearing for where the process plant will build. So this is all early works um, before the, the finalisation of the efforts, but we're we're confident we're we're on the way. Uh, we have actually got our very first piece of equipment out on site, which is our core shed. Um, so it's been built. So the boy, the, the boys and girls that are out there logging core, they've got a little air conditioned office and some actual facilities that they can work. Um, so they're happy. Uh, we've done quite a bit of drilling. Uh, most of the drilling has actually been to infill the resource and firm it all up, make sure we're, we're comfortable and happy with the, with the estimates that we're doing. Um, so you can see we've got quite a significant amount of drill holes, 420 so far in the last year and a half. Most of that has been at Little Eva and Blackard and, and we've sort of infilled Turkey Creek. We've currently got three rigs on site that are currently uh, drilling. We're, we're still finishing off some diamond at Blackard and we're stepping south, well, Legends actually, west of Blackard and, and Great Southern to the just to the south of Blackard. Um, so we've got yeah, a good 28, 28 people on uh, staff on site uh, and at Concurry that are, most of them are flying flat, although there are, we're, we've got quite uh, a good number of local locals working there with us as well. Um, Resource wise, this is currently currently our resources. So we're 30, 366 million tons at 0.4 copper and 0.04 gold. So not a huge amount of gold. Since we've picked it up, you can see this is originally this is where we're up in, in tons and grade. Most of that is extension drilling and at depth. So um, whilst a lot of the drilling was infill to firm this number up, we've actually added ounces and tons as well and copper tons as well. So um you can see we've 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 got currently a 287 million tons indicated and and seven the 80 million tons of, of inferred. Okay, so a bit of the Eva geology. So we're, we're sitting sitting here in the Mary Kathleen domain. Uh, the most of the resource of the native copper sits within what's called the rose of schists, which is a, a whole bunch of Semitic schists. And although I've got I got in trouble for using semite recently. Apparently, it's an old term, and I'm supposed to use it anymore. Um, but somatic schists, calc silicates, and um, some marbles. Little Eva at the northern end is it potentially sits within the Corella Formation, um, and it's sort of juxtaposed against it, it's faulted. Um, most of this material here, this is where a lot of the copper gold mineralization sits in this part of the world. Uh, and modified, potentially modified by the longer sweet granites. And that's length. So, hey. All right, so zooming in a little bit. Um, so it, you can see the deposits, the, where the deposits sit, most of them sit within what these schistose units, which is the Roseby 
rosemary schists. Uh, you've got a, a series of older granites at the seam, the, the Bumara metamorphics, and then a bit of the Corella formation sort of sitting around the edges. Um, most of this material here, there's some major structural breaks and big faults. There's the one that comes in around here, separates this part of the world from this part of the world. You got uh, the Napdale quartzite, which is basically uh, is considered a, a nape that sort of thrust up, comes in over the top, um, putting this older older thing over the top of these. And the thrust, this is sort of a thrust unit because it comes underneath it. Uh, the massive amount. So one of the interesting things about this rosebush schist is the amount of scapolite that floats about in it. Um, and the scapolite, is potentially part of the, the the alteration. So everything, everywhere you go up here, there's there's copper mineralization, there's albite alteration, there's everywhere you go, you can sort of pick up some sort of fluid. So the amount of fluid that's moved through this part of the world is huge. Um, very tightly deformed. Very like the when you actually look at the the various deposits, look at the rocks. Most of this stuff is tight isoclinal folds, rootless folds in the rocks. It's it's really really tightly deformed and sheared wow. um so we've got two main deposit types that we're, we're looking at one is the, the iron oxide copper gold suite um and it's the little eva bedford lady claire and ivian ivian sits down where are we down off on the side down here so most of the deposits up here where ivian sort of sits a little bit off to the side there Standard red rock altered. You look at these things; they're, they're really, really stained with, with um, albite, hemite, hematite, magnetite. Um, generally, got a gold gold component to them. They are not. Yeah, generally they come in these types of deposits are in sort of clusters, um, but you do get these major structural sort of. They they tend to sit in structural, big structural um, concentrations and, and zones. Uh, the native copper deposits we have, Black Art, Turkey Creek, Scanlon, there's a couple of others. The sulfide component that sits under these tends to be chalcopyrite bornite. I'll show some images of that. Little to no gold, although we occasionally get spots of gold poking up within them. You look at them, they look like they're potentially OAC, IOCG deposits that have lost their gold or didn't have the gold to begin with. So something about the chemistry of the host rock or something has meant that the gold hasn't precipitated, everything else moved on. Um, I only get some bits and pieces, other, other things floating about. Um, Little Eva, so we've done, this is just a quick, some couple of leapfrog shells from Little Eva, uh, north to the right of the page. Um, and the main high grade zone, so sits here, you've got a big wide zone, sits up here with a very narrow sort of northern extent. As you go south, it sort of breaks up, but most of our drilling you can see has been making sure we infill there so we understand what's happening at the south of the pit. And then we're starting to sort of look at the depth extents of these thing and seeing where, where some of these grades, this grade meanders to and what's happening to it. Um, the When we do the classification on these things the ore body tends to the, the pits tend to bottom out on the model so it's not that they're running out of of ore it's just that the the drilling runs out basically so good good potential for extensions blackard again most of our drilling is just filling in the northern end which was relatively under drilled and also filling in this zone here you can see in the light gray that's the the high price copper shell and dives down on that side of the world so and this was quite well under drilled and there's actually quite quite good grade this just sits in that part of the world so we've been sort of filling that out and, and infilling that make sure we have a good a, a good handle on what's going on um all right so just some pretty pictures this is standard little eva core um lots of chalcopyrite lots of magnetite lots of hematite albite um quite a lot going on so uh main ore types we've got chalcopyrite that exists as sort of an overprinting sort of infill type structure early magnetite albite hematite uh, the little thing about little eva is it's very very tightly constrained to the magnetite so you can when you 
clot up magnetite alongside the mineralization, it sits it's very, very tightly situated. So you don't have a huge amount of, in a lot of native of iron oxide, copper, gold, you might have the magnetite early, the mineralization kills the magnetite and, you end, and you're looking for sort of shadows and fuzzy areas within the magnet, magnetic signature. Uh, at Little Lever, we don't tend to get that. It tends to be quite a lot of magnetite floating about. Um, just some more interesting photos of the ore. So we had some all sorts of different textures, but a lot of copper floating about. This is some of the least, the, the lower grade areas. We can see the amount of magnetite through the air through it. Just some of this preceding or post post sort of albite hematite coming through. Um, we do get some weird and wacky rocks. Um, so Little Eve is hosted by a volcanic unit. It's been called volcanics, it's been called um, uh, porphyry, it's been called all sorts of stuff. But when you look at stuff like some of these things, you've got these poikoplastic sort of type units, um, a porphyritic sort of unit with some ghosts of various clasts that are potent around. Um, this, I don't know what that is. Uh, I, I think that might be potentially sort of long scapolitic type crystals or something that the whole thing is just an altered mess. Um, we get this is actually a nice nice sample which shows you know the background magnetite scapolite sort of alteration the hematite albite alteration some quartz veins some sulfide coming in then the hot pink alteration that comes uh, hematite alteration comes over the top and then a little bit of black at uh, bitite bitite chloride sort of retrograde stuff that's over the top of that um this is a class so you've got the, this is some sort of volcanic guessing. Um, porphyry with various class types clustered around. Some of the alteration coming in over the top. Big zones of chalcol pyrite sort of filling in some of these areas. Uh, this is just a zoom in showing a basic sort of quick parogenesis of what we think is going on. So you get this early scapolite plus albite hematite thing coming through, magnetite act actinolite, which you see through here, coming just washing through the project, uh, the rock. You've got biotite quartz calcite veins. In this case, some of these, these things coming through here, occasionally get biotite with them. Uh, chalk pyrite gold coming in over the top, leaking in around these quartz veins, coming in across this side. The hot pink, so this hot pink alteration comes through here. Here it's it's like a albite hematite with a little bit of calcite. Uh, it wanders along crystal edges. And it'll go and then it, then you, occasionally you see it it'll just chew, chew off across. So it's just finding whatever's whatever path it can find through the system. Then we get some late calcite veins um, and this late chloride epidote, which is what this black black thing is coming through here. Um, black art looks completely different. Uh, this is just a quick piece of black art. You can see the um, strongly sort of foliated, deformed sort of schistose unit, a bit of bornite poking about, um, big thick veins of, of sort of quartz carbonate. When we look at the rock types in here, you can see we've got um, various sort of, I don't know, sedimentary slash calcilicate rocks, um, banded units. This is quite a strongly folded with and foliated unit. Big zones of breccia. Um, this is another one. So you'd sort of, there's some folding cuts through around that, that vein. Um, but the basic trend of that sort of folded like this. And then you've got this overprinting pink hematite albite alteration in the fresher zones. So it's later quartz, uh, quartz carbonate. Um, some weird banded sedimentary units, maybe, or calcilicate units. Um, again, strongly foliated unit where some of these quartz veins that are following along the foliation direction. There's some quartz vein and there's a little bit of the hot pink sort of hematite calcite type uh, albite stuff. Um, here, the albite hematite's following along the bedding and you've got this strong fabric, foliation fabric, some something. Big breccia. So this is this tends to happen at the base of what of the weathered of the 
uh, late weathering that occurs where you get a lot of carbonate dissolution that's occurring in the rock and you get um, these breaches that occur that are basically um, like collapse breaches and things as the cavities start to foot and form and these things sort of dropping out in them. Um, and occasionally you get these big, these zones a bit breachier, big clasps and things sort of form in. Um, it's actually a quite interesting pyrogenesis you see at uh, at Blackard, and, and it's quite staged where you have this early chalk pyrite. You can see it's the chalk pyrite through here, and these little zones of bornite that are starting to grow and replace the chalk pyrite. So you got a stage where you got chalk pyrite going to bornite, and then later on where you you've got complete replacement of the chalk pyrite by bornite, and then it starts to get replaced by chalcosite. Um, and of course, the, the when you do that, you free up iron and sulfur, and as a result, you get these little blebs of pyrotite that start to drop out. So you, in this zone here, this period here, you're sort of moving a lot of iron and sulfur out of the system. Um, and I, I wonder if that's why we get the spotty golds, because that iron and sulfur is mobilizing the gold as well as something that's happening chemically. But once we get to this point, the gold's gone and you've got the bornite chalcopyrite going to chalcopyrite, uh, chalcosite and a little bit of the, the, it's not mobilizing the iron and sulfur away. It's just dropping out as pyrotite. Um, but these zones of bornite are actually, you can get some really nice sort of big wide zones of bright sort of purpley blue bornite through the place. Um, this is just, a, this is at our Great Southern, the Great Southern deposit. So this is one of the, leading edge, I guess, of where the native, the bornite goes to native copper. And you can start to see there's a little bit of dissolution starting to occur along the veins and the, the, the sulfides are going to native copper. Um, after weathering, what happens is that these the sulfides, the bornite chalcosite get completely whipped out and you end up with native copper being left behind and the rock becomes quite porous, broken, um, and so this is what we call the base of our supergene zone. It's a paleo weathering zone that that impacts the, the horizon. Um, age of this, don't know, but it's overprinted by the more recent oxidation profile that we get. Um, uh, some of the bornite, the big slabs of bornite that we can get through here. Um, other, a whole bunch through here, but sort of the whole rock. And some of this rock, when you get away, into the host, you can actually see that it's just really penetrated with chalk pyrite. You get close to these veins and it starts to go to bornite, but the, the whole rock's just washed with really fine grain um, chalk pyrite. Uh, one thing that I should mention that hey, it worked that time, there you go. Um, one of the things that happens at this point, unfortunately, is some of the copper gets mobilized into hydrobiotite. So the, the copper gets actually caught within the, the um, crystals within the crystal structure of the biotite, um, which makes it unrecoverable. So um, we're trying to map where that sort of stuff. So you just looks at the biotype; it's got a high copper content. Um, so that that impacts some of our recovery. Um, with some of the extra drilling, most of the drilling in the past has always been RC, which makes it really hard to understand what the the actual geology is doing underneath. So there's always a bold at Blackard that was interpreted. And as we're going down, we're starting to see some of these changes in bedding as we go at depth and start getting a fold axis to start to appear. And this piece of quartz that comes from here is actually a fold nose that sits right, right there. Um, so you can actually see it's quite strongly deformed, but we know it does this on the top. So we're looking at refold and folding that's occurring. Um, and the, the, the Mineralization follows tends to follow that structure, so or the horizon. So whatever that mineralized horizon is, is got it's, it's highly reactive. The, the fluids have hit it, um, but it's not sin sedimentary because the the mineralizations can actually be seen to cut across it in places and disappear. So it's just fluids have come in, hit whatever this unit is, and washed across it. Um, when you look at core within this, you can actually see it's really, really strongly deformed and almost like it's a massive shear. So you know, a great big wide shear zone that's been completely sort of ductly deformed and then refolded at a later point. And at that point later on, the mineralization sort of comes in and takes out this thing. Um, 
So Turkey Creek, I mentioned it was, it was quite interesting. So Turkey Creek sits just outside Little Eva. This is just a piece of core that shows how banded it is, banded. Um, it is quite strongly deformed. You get lots of rootless, little rootless folds and things within it. Um, and it's essentially from the chemistry, an unweathered version of black art. So it's a long way to the north and it seems to be in a different stratigraphic horizon, but it's actually the bottom part of, of what we think is black art. So the chemistry is the same, everything's the same with it, except it's in the wrong spot, which actually opens up some nice into questions about what happened tectonically and structurally to get this deposit dis displaced the way that it is. Um, so I just jump into some cross sections that we've had, um, that we've got. So this is Little Eva, um, the resource model that we've, we did. And then these holes are, are basically going in, just validating cross cutting, testing, testing some of this area down here. You can see most of the drilling sort of stops up here. So we've drilled in and put in some deeper holes. We get some, some, you know, some good 90 meters, 0.6. 114 meters point four. That's not a high grade ore body. 145 at 0.76. They they all confirm what the resource model was done. So, from a mining perspective, this is like a factory. Massive tons moved through and to low grade. Um, but to, to date, the drilling has actually uh, informed us as as basically confirmed the model. Um, we'll, you can see here these are the mine the mine designs at various prices. Uh, point, can't remember, point three, three, uh, three eight. Is it three eight? Yeah, point three eight was the mine plan. This is the the five fifty shell. So, um, <coughs> we go to Blackard. Blackard is um, again most of our drilling has actually been. You can see we're sort of clustered to the south centre where most of the of the ore body is, and most of the drilling sort of stopped. Because a lot of this drilling was targeting the base of native copper, as they they sort of as soon as they hit the fresh rock, they stopped. Which is why this is this blue is the base of native copper, and a lot of the drilling actually stops to punch us through it because that was the the directive at the time. Uh, when you start to drill through that and come out the bottom, you start getting some some nice intercepts, seventy seven at point six, including two meters at three percent copper. Um, we've got up a little bit higher here. 10 metres at 1.3, overall interception here at 90 at 0.6. So a lot of that, you can see the under, underlying ore body and this these drill holes are sort of uh, uh, reporting back to that and, and informing it now. So it gives us a lot of confidence in our, in our model. Um, Turkey Creek, Turkey Creek's an interesting little thing. It's, um, there's, there's some sort of structural thing break coming on through here. So this is this structure here. There's a major break that runs up along this side. The Turkey Creek fault cuts the deposit into two and this then wraps around to the north. Um, interestingly, the base of oxidation as we go to the north, it gets deeper and oxide material is essentially oxide copper. So azurite uh, native copper, um, azurite malachite, uh, non-recoverable type material. But at the south end, this base of oxidation, we've got a little bit of non-recoverable stuff, but then we start to get into some some good stuff. Um, it is actually, but this section is quite a bit south, but we step into the core of the pit. There's actually two horizons, um, and it's just a long folded tablet, I guess, of material. Um, like I said, exactly, it seems to be the same type of thing as, as black art. Um, we've done some. Uh, some regional geophysics in the area. One of those is the detailed gravity. Um, and so this is quite quite detailed. It's it's laid over here. So you can see the, the little Eva deposits that sits under this high grade gravity anomaly or this high gravity anomaly here, um, high magnetite and some strong magnet, uh, igneous rocks. You'd expect it to be relatively high. Um, Blackard sits here and you can see in this low so the gravity mapping sort of picks out that low really nicely. So that's the destruction of the, um, the sort of where it gets, the native copper gets left behind, uh, the structure of the host rock. And it wraps it around up to the legend deposit. So you can see that's a, quite a significant structure. Um, you got, as we go up here, you can get some weathering 
the weathering starts to get deeper up in this part of the world. But that's actually low, allowing us to get some really good, good detailed sort of geology of what's going on, some of the structures, some of the breaks. Um, and the plan is to start to extend that back to the south so we get some, a better, better picture of what's going on. Um, okay, so we've got some geomet work that we've been doing. Um, it, it's interesting. You, so we throw, I've thrown some of these elements, the titanium, iron, cobalt, chrome, arsenic, uh, rubidium, strontium, calcium, and potassium into the, they're all correlated to each other. So we, we did a PCA on them. Really nice bimodal, bimodal sort of signature, which maps out the volcanic unit really, really well. Uh, and then we did it to so the, the fourth PCA as an, a slight small peak, which we mapped out here. And that's the hanging wall volcanic that we get. And when you start looking at these things, you can start to pull out some bits and pieces. By about the fourth or fifth PCA, the rest of it's just noise. So it's not, not worth looking at. Uh, but that's actually allowing us to actually bring out some really nice tight geological ideas of what's going on. The main problem we face with, with especially at Little Eva, is it's so altered and so destroyed that the guys just struggle to actually pick up rock types. Um, when you start throwing sort of all these different little bits of components into each other, they, they start to stand out and you can start to map out the, the lithologies. Uh, AMC have done some work for us using the Geomet. Um, throwing a lot of detail in, uh, a lot of chem elements, so these little element maps. So this little lever, and you can see here, this is Black Art, this is Turkey Creek. Uh, apart from the intensity, they're actually, chemistry is almost identical. Uh, and the belief is these two things will behave metallurgically exactly the same. So um, when we look at distribution of, of the copper, by uh, copper sulfur ratios, you can see this the smattering of of the chalcopyrite pyrite sort of through here. Very strong bornite on both of them, a little bit chalcosite and some native copper sort of floating about. Uh, the native copper at Turkey Creek is rarely seen. It tends to sit a little bit higher because most of the oxidation profile is the the super gene profile has been eroded away. It's gone, um, and all we've got is a little bit oxide to sit up top. Very different to Little Eva. Little Eva is, is very strongly chalk pyrite dominated with some just some other scattering stuff. And again, this is a little bit of oxidation that just sits at the top. So you get a little bit of native copper and that floating about there as well. Um, so a lot of a lot of good work coming out with the, the geomet studies as well. Um, so concluding wise, um, significant amount of drilling that's been done, 97,000 meters. Uh, a lot of diamond core, which is actually allowing us to do some serious insights into what's going on in the geology. Where um, we've done a few trials, things like um, the true core scans and those sort of things to try to work out, get a good picture of what's going on. Um, got the, the gravity. There's um, we've done some gravity. We've done mag. Um, some various other studies that have been done. Um, Brownfields exploration is currently focused. Since most of the drilling has been done in and around the the current resources, excuse me, so that we can firm it all up, get a good idea of what's going on. And then they're just starting to, to step out from there. And we're just starting to actually look at programs further afield and some more regional resource uh, exploration projects. Um, so hopefully we can bring in some more updates later on. Um, I think that's, that's all I've got. Yes. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Just initially, a, a, a few to, to start with. Whilst I walk over to there, I'll ask you one question. In the two years you've held the project, has there been any geological or mineralization surprises compared to what you thought when you bought the property? Um, I wouldn't. It's interesting surprises. I wouldn't say surprises, but there's some interesting movement of where the where the ore bodies seem to be going. Um, when you actually start to pull it apart and looking at it 
from a, an a overall project as opposed to a series of a series of deposits and you start putting it in all together you can start to see some interesting tectonic and structural impact on it uh, but also where the ore body seems to like little Eva seems to be stepping a little bit towards the northeast or where a little bit at odds to where the, the current modeling or the historic modeling indicated that it might be going um, and some of the folding that's starting to see in black hard that's showing some really complicated um, twists and turns that um, that sort of take some bit of extra thought I guess to understand uh, Ron that was a fantastic speech um, presentation I find you're a really easy guy to listen to it's a very you present very it's easy to Thanks, listen to you Rob. present um, my question is um, if people are going to say what are you doing here what are you talking about it's a geomet question I've never worked anywhere where there's a lot of native copper what's the process for getting the copper out of the rock obviously it's not flotation what do you do with all that native copper Good question. When I mean, you can answer it, come and see me. Um, you know, where it's so some of it will come out gravity via gravity, although, and we do have, um, we, we are looking at various ways of making sure we increase the current recoveries that we get from the native copper is about 60, 65% um, in that window, I guess. Um, so we're, we're looking at ways that we can uplift that. Um, and if we can get some sort of gravitational sort of circuit that might upgrade it a little bit. Who knows? But yeah, we do have we do have people trying to improve that from the 60, 65 that it sits at at the moment. Oh, hello, Ron. Um, good to see you again. Um, can you bring up the slide that had the resources on? <laughs> oh, okay. Right at the very front. I just want one question. I just I'm not sure if I I missed something. Hang on. I'm going to keep up keep up with it. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. yeah, I know. <laughs> there we go. So you've got no measured. Any reason for that? Because it hasn't been grade controlled, drilled, or face sampled. Fair enough. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> just, just on the the various pits, the optimized pits. What I just couldn't. What do they go down to? Are we talking about three hundred meters, or that? Some of them do go down quite deep, yeah. Um, so 200 to 300 metres in places, uh, depending on the price we use, of course. Um, the the life of mine process, some of those pits are, are around the sort of 220, 230 sort of level. Um, and, but then when we put in the, the more optimised prices, which is often not even the current price, uh, they, do, they do tend to dive down a little bit in places, so... Uh, it's, like I said, because it, it, it's a quarry, uh, we're looking at current studies are, are looking to upgrade from the 11 that was done to sort of fire up into the 16s plus tons, many tons per annum. So just it's just a big factory moving moving dirt. And when you do that, you drop your, drop your costs. And Great, thanks. Top down. Um, just a, a question from our online group. So, Ron, excellent talk. What are your thoughts on the age of the copper and do you think there are is any relationship with Dougal River? Um, yes. <laughs> uh, the, the, so the copper, the copper is, um, well, it depends on which camp you sit in. If you're JCU camp, it's the D2.5, basic, same age as a lot of the um, regional peak metamorphic style. Yeah. Um, it tends to come across... Dougal River, some of the drilling, the core and the samples of Dougal River does tend to have some of the same iron oxide copper gold signatures that you see at um, in the area around Blackard, sort of Nate, all that's that area. Um, it just seems to be a little bit lower temperature, so you get a little bit more lead zinc coming through. But there's some interesting copper copper hits there. Um, from what I understand, I've seen a couple of holes, historical holes that have definitely got copper in it as well. Um, so yeah, no, there's some interesting stuff poking around. Another question from Doug. So it seems to me you're going consistently going from charcoal pyrite to bornite to native copper. So what's chewing up the sulfur? I don't know. <laughs> charcoal pyrite, bornite, chalcosite, native copper. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so something's whipping the, the sulfur out of the system. Um, I don't know. Haven't looked at it, and I'm not sure. There might be some people who've got an idea. 
Uh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of fluids it, moving through, and I haven't spent the time to. It's interesting it. that people argue that Mount Isa is the opposite. Yeah. That it's there because the lead zinc's there, and it's the copper is chewing up the sulfur from the lead zinc. But yeah. this seems to be the opposite. Well, I mean, if you, there are some from, from memory, and I could be wrong here, so yeah, I'm playing on an old memory at this point, but um, the the Dougal River lead zinc is, is lower lower temperature than the copper that sits underneath it, and we've got a lot of copper floating about. So as as an old old boss of mine once said, every deposit's the same. It's just the temperature you're poking around at. Um, so, you yeah, know, when you look at even at Mount Isa, you look at the copper ore bodies are down low, the native, the, the lead zinc's up high, maybe they are all just related structurally and metamorphically. So, uh, Thanks, Ron. Um, I've got two questions. Firstly, your, your resource table unfortunately looks a little short on gold, but <laughs> you did mention Tick Hill. Do you have any... Um, more gold rich prospects in the area so there is so you go down south of the of um let's move this out of the way for a second i don't want to leave it because there's people there's comments there that i don't need it that far um so as we go to the south just the set our tenements on the south side uh river. so just to the south we've got like the Quarmby Quarmby projects um and some conglomerate projects there that are actually um Wonga I think are actually gold rich and a lot lot more gold to the south um so there is there is gold in the area Tick Hill who knows I mean Tick Hill the the gold anomaly that found Tick Hills was seven ppb and because their minimum cutout was 10 they missed it for years and then somebody decided to, what happens if they look at it lower, lower cutoff. And then they realized the sample, the, the sample location was on the wrong side of the creek. So they followed up the wrong side of the creek for a little while before they checked the other side. So yeah, Tick Hill, you you can go within meters of Tick Hill and not know it's there. So there could be a Tick Hill, who knows? It's like hard to find. Okay, my other one was um you got you guys are obviously trying to prove up an open pitable resource, but what would be your sort of deepest significant intercept? Deepest significant intercept? That'd be on Mike Humphrey's mind more than my mind. <laughs> 40 at two. 40 at two. But how deep? How far? Yeah. About 250 metres. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. Thanks. 40 metres at 2%. Any further questions? Hold on, Doug. I'll go to Simon first and come back. Sorry, Ron, don't mean to. Uh, no, you'll be familiar, obviously, yeah. with uh, chalcosite at, uh, as a primary feature in gunpowder. Yep. Any of your chalcosite got any evidence being primary? No, everything we see, there, it's it's uh, some secondary alteration process. Uh, yeah. Not, I wouldn't say it's an oxidation, like weathering process. It's It seems to be some sort of fluid fluid process that's at in the sulfide depths so um i wouldn't primary ish i guess um just to go back to the the last question we probably didn't get to hear what your response was mike could you just respond yeah one of the best hits we've had to date is on the um is on the little lever deposit and there's a 40 at two at around 250 meters below surface and black hard, you can get up to, I don't know, 17 metres at 1.8% at yeah. depth. Uh, not a black hard, no. Uh, gold credits at EVA, yes. Thank you. Doug. Uh, just uh, following up the gold uh, question, IVN's got a bit of gold in it, if I remember rightly. IVN does. And it, and it sits well away from the rest of those deposits. So what's the difference? Uh, IVN, well, it's down there somewhere. Um, nothing. IVN is is a basic iron oxide, so it's very similar to Bedford, which is a, which is a iron oxide copper gold sort of actinolite. IVN is very similar. Um, it's it's on on that 
major structure that's just onto the right hand, the eastern side of this structure, as opposed to the you know, sort of same position as Bedford. Um, it's still quite small. It's there's no mining li license on it at the moment. It's, it forms part of our our assemblage of deposits that we're sort of looking at, but it's it's it needs a needs the work to grow it to make it useful, and it's um at the moment it's just too far away from from what we so we haven't actually focused on it a huge amount at this point. So last question for the evening from uh, online. It's a follow up to the gold discussions. What happened to the gold? So should the G be dropped from IOCG? <laughs> no, because there is some gold. Uh, and even even at uh, Blackard and Legend, um, some of those native copper, native copper, I use, use that because it's what they're called, the copper deposits, native copper deposits, but the sulfide component of that does occasionally have spotty gold. So we know there was gold in the system. Um, it's just rare, rare to find. So have you had a chance to really consider what the characteristics are of the gold poor deposits versus the ones that have some gold credits within your tenements? No, not at this stage. Um, and, and like, admittedly, when I when I worked for Universal, it was as a big, the native copper was a sediment hosted copper deposit. And uh, Little Eva, Bedford, that were iron oxide, copper, gold deposits are two completely different deposits sort of in the same area. Uh, now, but looking at these things, no, I don't think so. I think it's all, the whole area is just one great big fluid transport horizon. And depending on what what the host rocks were when those fluids are washed through, determines on what's sort of precipitated out and what's happened with them. Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions from the audience or online. So please join me in thanking Ron for a fantastic talk. It's been a, a great opportunity to hear what uh, Harmony have been doing in the last two years, and you've been extremely busy. So thank you for taking the time and giving us an update, Ron. No worries, you're welcome. Thank you.